Welcome Calvary Online. I'm Jonice and I'm the Director of Outreach and this is Pastor Paul. He's in pastoral care. Hi there. Hey. Yeah, so please say hi in the chat. Tell us where you're watching from, what your favorite food is, what your dog's name is, or anything else fun that you would want to share with us. All right. So every month, if you live in our area, you have a chance to reach our community through something we call Love Your Neighbor Outreaches. It's an opportunity for us to activate our faith by going out and serving in some of the most vulnerable populations in Broward County. To give you a glimpse into what this looks like, we're actually here doing an outreach at a convalescent home. You may not know this, but more than 65% of the residents that live in long-term care facilities never receive a visit from a family or a friend. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here to sing songs. We're here to spend time with them, read the Bible with them, and we really want to just be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're actually here right now with Helen, who I have her permission to share. She's going to be 97 years old this July, 97 years old. So I wanted to bring her in just to ask her, what has this ministry and what have these outreaches actually done for you living here in this facility? Oh, I just make, they just make me so, I can't explain. Happy? Yes. They've been wonderful. 
Excellent. When they come every Sunday, I like the preaching of the word. It increases my knowledge. They also have, they also let me contribute if I have something to contribute, which makes me feel good. What? And Paula, I know that there are some really great stories that come out of some of these Love Your Neighbor events. Do you have one or two you'd like to got share? got about 385 of them. Just one, please. Just, just one. one. That's just... all we have time for. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, we did a Love Your Neighbor event in our staff. And our staff went out and visited one of our local care facilities, nursing homes. And we had uh, uh, three or four of the staff that knew how to play the piano and could sing. So we had a little concert right in the middle of this facility. They had a baby grand piano waiting for us. We started singing some That's songs. Great. It was absolutely great. But as we were singing the songs, we saw the residents and we saw the staff just openly weeping. And one of the staff came up to me afterwards and says, Paul, you have no idea how much we needed this today. So that's just one Beautiful. of a thousand stories that we could share. That's so beautiful. And that's really what Love Your Neighbor is all about. You get to pour into people. And the blessing is that we come out encouraged. Amen. All right. So in just a minute, we're going to jump into today's service. But first, let's look back and review last week's message. You may remember it was about Jesus wanting to do a new thing in our life. So for a refresher, let's take a look at that takeaway from last week and then talk about how it connects to today's message. If you try to use a wineskin twice, well, after you use it once, it's lost its flexibility. Now it's rigid. And so if you pour new wine and it's going to burst the wine skin, it's going to ruin the skin and the wine. And everyone knows no one in their right mind would do that. And then Jesus says essentially this, the, the kingdom of God that's coming, the old systems of self-righteous religion cannot contain what God is now doing in the world through me. This is a new covenant. It's grace. It's mercy. It's God showing up in the world to take on the sin of the world, to pay the debt of the world, and to give everyone a way back to God. And this is really, really, really good news, right? I love that message because we all get a fresh chance when God does a new thing in and through us. Amen. Now let's turn our hearts towards worship as we join the Fort Lauderdale team. Yes. Can we stand to our feet? Put your hands together. Let's worship Jesus together. I'll sing it if you know. To the King of glory in life, all praises. To the Lord of life, our maker. It's our open wide, we worship you. See what love has done, amazing. He bought us with His blood, our Savior. The cross has overcome, we worship You.
thankful for Jesus in this place. Yes. Hey, listen, this weekend is special because tomorrow is Palm Sunday. And the reason we remember this Sunday is because this is the week before Jesus is, resur Jesus is resurrected. It's his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And here's the thing about Palm Sunday. It's interesting because the same people that shouted Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, were also the same people that said crucify him a week later. But the reason the church remembers this day today is because we know exactly how that story ends. Amen. It ends with a resurrected Jesus. It ends with a Jesus that is seated at the right hand of the Father. It ends with a Jesus that has conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. That's worth celebrating. Amen. Can we give praise to Jesus? Because in a week's time, the church is going to gather and we're going to sing and we're going to celebrate because of what Jesus has done. It is the finished work of Jesus that makes us alive today. And the same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in us today. Amen. Can anybody testify to the resurrection power of Jesus? He's good. And so let's continue in worship, making much of him in this place, remembering that he came to live, to die, but not stay in the grave. He rose and he reigns now and forever. Let's sing together.
praising our Savior all the day long. Come on. So this is our story. And this is our song. Yes. Praising our Savior. the name of Jesus in this place. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we thank you that this gets to be our story. <laughs> thank you, God. This is our story. This is our song. Because of what you have done. Not because of anything we did. Not because we pulled ourselves up by our own strength. Not because we attend a church every Sunday. But Lord, it's because you saved us. You rescued us. You gave us new life. When we were dead in our sin, you rescued us and brought us into life. Thank you, Jesus. We are never the same. We are never the same. It's because of you, and it's only because of you. It's only ever been because of you, and it only ever will be because of you. You rescued us, Lord. Help us to never forget that. Help us to never forget the message of the gospel that transformed our life forever, that you lived the life that we should have lived but definitely could not. And you died the dead that we so rightly deserve so that we may have a chance at friendship with the living God today. What a privilege that we get to have friendship with God Almighty today. And it's because of what you have done, Jesus. You rewrote our story. Oh, thank you, God. You rewrote our story. And now we will sing forever and ever, every single day of our life. Would you give us grace? to make much of you, Jesus, in our life. Wherever we go, in every conversation, wherever we are, in our workplaces, work, school, it doesn't matter. Help us to live lives that make much of you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, even right now, I just pray that you would even begin by your spirit to open up your ear, open up our ears. And open up our eyes as we prepare to hear the preaching of your word. That it wouldn't just be words off a page that's read to us and that we leave Saturday night as if nothing happened. But God, that you would pierce through our hearts, convict us of our sin, bring us back to you, draw us close to you this evening, Jesus. Show yourself in a way that we've never experienced before. And we would leave transformed. We would not leave the same way that we came in. Help us, Lord. We thank you in advance for the good work that you're going to do in our life. We believe and trust in the name of Jesus today, the name that is above every name, the name that has the power to save, the name that reigns and is seated at the right hand of the Father. You are so good. We love you, Jesus. Calvary Chapel loves Jesus. Amen. So it's in Jesus' matchless name, Calvary, we said. Amen. Amen, amen. How many of you are grateful that God is very much involved and the author of the story of our lives? 
I know I am. My name is Annie, and I'm so privileged to get to welcome you to church this weekend. And like Jamie said, this is a time where we pause and we remember Palm Sunday weekend, where 2,000 years ago, Jesus was entering into Jerusalem the week before he was going to be resurrected. It's such a cool story. You can read about it in Matthew 21. But my favorite part of the whole story is in the last two verses. You can check out the verses on the screen. It's verses 10 and 11 of Matthew 21. It says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. If you can picture yourself in Jerusalem that weekend, I almost picture it like, what if it was happening in downtown Fort Lauderdale and everyone is like, who is this? What are we talking about? And that question of who is this? Who is Jesus? And I think about the thousands upon thousands of people that are gonna be joining churches all around the world next week weekend and of our friends and our family who are asking that same question, who is Jesus? And I want to challenge you this week to invite someone that you're praying for, maybe a family member, a friend, a co-worker to church. Next weekend, we have Easter services on Good Friday at 630 here. And then as well as on Sunday, starting bright and early at 7 a.m. And I'm going to give you a little challenge challenge. Is that okay? I want to challenge you to sacrifice a couple of hours of sleep on Sunday morning to join us for our sunrise service at 7 a.m. I know some of you are not morning people. That's why you're here on Saturday nights. But Sunday morning at 7 has become a great tradition for our church as we will be out on the football field hearing the message, worshiping together during a beautiful sunrise. And when you join us at 7 a.m. on Sunday, you create space for one more person to hear the gospel for our next services that day. So I hope to see you there. We're talking about how Jesus gives us everything to live for. And one of the best parts of following Jesus is the freedom that we get to experience. And how many of you in here have been through freedom groups before? That's right, I see some hand. Freedom is incredible. If you don't know what it is, it's an eight-week group experience that's designed to allow us to experience more of the freedom that a relationship with Jesus brings. So go ahead and check out the screens for more information. You guys good? Some of you are frightened because you've never seen me before. You're waiting for security to take me off the stage. I'm actually a pastor here. My name is Chris Basalici, and I serve as the campus pastor in Plantation and get to come here with you guys every once in a while to share God's word, which I'm excited to do tonight. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 10. So if you guys got Bibles, Bible apps, take them out, open it up. Matthew chapter 10. If you didn't bring a Bible with you tonight, you want to follow along with a hard copy, no worries. Raise your hands. We got some people coming down the rows right now. They will put a Bible in it. And as you are finding your way there, of course, I want to welcome everyone watching online right now at our online campus. Um, I just kind of want to reiterate something that Annie said. You know, next weekend, next weekend is what? Um, we're going to try that one more time. Guys, next weekend is what? Easter. We should be excited about that. And I know that you guys are Saturday night people, um, but, but please do not forget that if you show up here next Saturday, who's going to be here? 
No one but you. Like, go for it. Hang out outside. Do a prayer walk. I, great. But no one's going to be here. We would really love for you to, though, pray about attending the 7 a.m. service. And by pray about, I, I mean just do it. Because we, we really want to make room at the 9 and the 11 o'clock for people to come and hear the gospel. So, I, you know, I, I know you may not be a morning person, but for that one-day sacrifice, it's going to be a great experience as we're all out there together celebrating the resurrection of our King. Amen? Amen. Uh, and listen, lots of information about stuff happening here in all of our campuses. And so anytime you want to take your phone out, you can open up your camera. You can scan the QR code right there that's on that screen or on the back of the seats for more information about all of that. But let's get into God's word tonight. Let's pray before we do so because we couldn't even understand it without him. So let's ask for his help. Father, we love you. We love you because you loved us first. Tonight we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate your son and our savior. And we come before you tonight, not in fear, but boldly as sons and daughters because of what he has done for us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the life that you lived and the death that you died on the cross. Thank you that today you are risen and seated at the right hand of the Father. Thank you that we have a hope in you that goes beyond anything this world could offer. Thank you that we have a place to come tonight and to get into your word, but more than that, we pray that your word would get into us. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Give us understanding, and may your word convict, exhort, even rebuke us where we need to be rebuked. We're willing to, to allow you to do that in our lives tonight. Have your way, God. And when we leave here, we want to be more like our Savior. We want to be more in love with our Savior. So please, please, we are here drawing near, and you promised that when we would do that, you would draw near to us, and we believe that you're a God of your word. So please, have your way, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Did that scare anyone? That wasn't a mistake. You're like, oh, someone in the AV booth is messed up. No, that, that wasn't a mistake. Does anybody know what that was? It's the assembly bugle call. And what that is, if you're in the armed forces, it is a signal that tells soldiers to assemble at a designated place, to take it seriously, to come, to stand at attention, and, and most of the time, it is to receive orders of some kind from their commander. And when, so, when soldiers hear this call, they run, they stand at attention, and they listen. And I want us to kind of approach Matthew chapter 10 like that tonight, because tonight in Matthew chapter 10, we see Jesus call and assemble 12 of his disciples before him so that he can give them very specific orders about a very specific mission. That's what we see tonight in Matthew chapter 10. Look with me there. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. Now, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot the one who betrayed him. Stop right there. If you got a paper Bible, you can maybe circle the word called there because in the original language, the, that word called, it means to summon and assemble soldiers together. So again, this wasn't just your normal, hey guys, let's have a quick conversation. What Jesus is about to tell them is something very serious. And if you were with us last week at the end of Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is, is a king and he's on a mission and he's, he's looking over all of these people that are like sheep scattered without a shepherd. And he's got this compassionate heart and he looks at his disciples. He says, do you see all those people? There's so many of them. There's so many of them that need to know me. And, and, and the, the harvest is ripe, but there's a problem. What was the problem? The laborers are what? Few. And so what does he tell them to do? Pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would raise up workers. And I'm sure at that point, the disciples probably thought, man, that was profound, Jesus. That was deep. They maybe even prayed that prayer. They had no idea that they themselves would be the answer to that prayer. And that is what Jesus is doing right here. He calls and separates 12 of his disciples and in a sense promotes them and makes them apostles. 
He gives them authority and power. And here's what he's about to do. They've seen him. They've seen him do miracles. They've heard him preach. They've seen him on mission. And now he's sending them out to take part of that very mission themselves, the mission of the kingdom. And and here's what we need to kind of think about tonight is that their mission is our mission today. Do you believe that? Oh, you don't convince me with that. Do you believe that? Yes. And so, so again, I, I just want you to receive the words of God tonight as if Jesus was here speaking to you. That this is our mission. And and all throughout the rest of Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is going to give us some very specific orders for the mission. Look with me at verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, now freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person. Stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, then leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Let's stop right there. When it comes to these orders, these marching orders, if you will, the first point tonight is this, that the mission requires movement. The mission that Jesus is giving them and still gives to us. It requires movement. And just to be clear, the first part of these orders are given to the apostles, specifically in this specific instance. Context is key. It's not specifically to be applied to us today when Jesus says, don't go to the Gentiles, go to who? Israel. Specifically speaking to them in this instance, he's telling them, here's what I want you to do. Focus on your people. Focus on on Galilee. Make this a short-term mission trip. Has anyone ever been on a short-term mission trip from our church? Anyone? He's like, I don't want you to go out for months, and I don't see you for a long time. Let's just keep it local. Now, this is a temporary command, because what does Jesus tell them later on in Matthew 28? Go and make disciples of who? All nations. So don't get all hung up on this idea where he's saying, don't go to the Gentiles. This is specifically for them in this moment. But, but the command and the mission starts with this idea, go, go. And to go requires movement. Jesus, in essence, is saying, move your feet. Don't stay still. Go. Now, now listen. Christians were, were primarily not to be a sitting people. Does anyone like to sit around and be comfortable? I was considering making you stand up at this point, but I'm not going to do it because I get dirty looks when I do that. But as, and I love I, one of the greatest privileges of, of becoming a son or a daughter of God through Jesus is being able to sit at his feet and to listen to his voice, to love him. I love that we get to do this on the weekends, but we are not primarily a sitting down kind of people. We are a sent people. And here's the problem sometimes that happens with us, if we want to be honest. As our world and our nation and our culture gets crazier and crazier. Is it not getting crazier out there? Yes. We sometimes have a tendency to want to stay still. We don't want to go anymore. No, you know, we think it's a good idea, like we should all get together and maybe build a bunker with some like water and guns and Bibles and Chick-fil-A and never go out there again. (laughs) We want like this perpetual holy huddle. We don't want to go. We want to stay. And guys, I get it. But Jesus says the mission that I'm sending you on requires you to go. We are all a sent people. Move your feet. Get out there into the world. I know it's dark, but doesn't the light shine brightest in the darkness? I mean, we we have to be a people that aren't so apt to curse the darkness and never shine a light. And we're called to go out there and shine a light, and not so that people will look at us, but so that people will look at who? 
Oh, that was one of the easy ones I give you tonight. Come on, guys. We go out there and shine a light, not so people will look at us, but people look at who? Jesus, exactly. We have to go. You have a mission field. I mean, you pull off any property, any campus. Have you seen the sign that says you are now entering the mission field? Guys, whether you, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, you have all been sent out on mission. Your neighborhood, your job, your school, your gym, wherever you shop, that is your mission field. And Jesus is sending you saying, go. But it's not just move your feet. It also requires you moving your lips. He says, preach the gospel that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Preach the good news. See, many of us, I think we're okay with moving our feet. We're willing to go out there. We've got jobs. We've got lives. We go to school. We, we do all that stuff. But when it comes to this part of moving our lips, can I ask you guys a question? And I don't want you to answer it out loud. I really want you to answer it in your heart. When's the last time you told someone about Jesus? When's the last time you told someone who didn't know him about the kingdom of heaven? When's the last time you told someone, man, I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once dead, but now I'm alive. When's the last time? So you got to look for opportunities like that. I was at a place last week and I met this guy who looked kind of like me, but I know he wasn't a believer. And I, and I, I, like, I love when people ask the question, so what do you do? And I'm like, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor. He's like, what? And, and, he, and, and, I, and the next question, it's like he just lofted it up there for me. So how did that happen? I love that. I love that. Listen, because in my job, I'm surrounded by Christians all day long. Christians are crazy. I love it. But I don't get to be around people that don't know him like that. And so when, when, when opportunities present themselves, I'm like, yes, here it is. Do you look for opportunities like that? Do you pray for opportunities like that? Do you wake up every morning and say, Father, today, today put someone in my path that's going to ask me that question. I promise you this. Is that the will of the Father for you? Is that the mission we're sent on? I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, if you pray in the morning, God, give me an opportunity today. Do you think he's going to answer that prayer? Yes. We must be a people on the move. Moving our feet and moving our lips and moving our hands. Now, the, the power that he gave to those apostles is not necessarily the power that he gives to us. And I don't have time to dive into that, but I think the essence of what Jesus is saying is go and serve people. Go, go to those in need, those that are sick, those that are dying, those that are the oppressed, the outcast, the marginalized, the lost, and minister to them. Don't just tell people about Jesus. Show them Jesus. This is the mission that we are on. And I love what he, he says, freely you've received, freely give. Anything good in your life, who gave it to you? God. James, right? Father of lights, everything good that we have. And I mean, your salvation, forgiveness, redemption, adoption, hope, peace, all of those things come from who? Did you pay for it? Who paid for it? He says, you, Jesus paid for it. You've been given it freely. Now spend your life giving it away. Do not be selfish with your salvation is what he's saying. This is our mission. And it's not optional, guys. It's not just for pastors or missionaries. Imagine, imagine it was Jesus up here today. Not me. He probably have no tattoos and a longer beard. Imagine him. But, but how much more serious would you take it if, if it was? If he was looking out across this room saying, this is the mission. Move. Go. I'm getting old. And, and here's the thing. As I get old, when I stay still for too long, I get stiff. Like I, when I, I'm on the couch, I like lay down on my side. And the other day I got up after like 10 minutes. I'm like, I can't move. And I had to like stretch from sitting down on the couch. Some of us are, are kind of like that. We've been coming and seeing and sitting and we're kind of stiff. And brothers and sisters, we need to move. We need to go. <laughs> 
We need to start to, to stretch those muscles and move our feet and move our lips and move our hands. Listen, Easter's a week away. Did y'all get one of these invitations yet? Don't lie in church. Some of y'all got like four in your car, like in the trunk or on the floor somewhere. This is a great opportunity this week to stretch. And as I tell people at our campus all the time, you don't treat this like a grenade and throw it at someone and run. You have a conversation. You say, hey, I'm, I'm going to church on Easter Sunday. Would you come with me? It's that time when people are more apt to come. Guys, this is the mission. Not just to come and see, but to go and tell. Do you believe that? Yeah. Amen. All right, back to Matthew chapter 10. Look at verse 16. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You're going to be handed over to the local councils to be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death. If a father is child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, then flee to the other. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household stop there. That was a lot. The second point, if you want to write this down, is that the mission will be met with resistance. The mission will be met with resistance. I'm thinking that maybe at this point, the disciples were thinking, this sounds awesome. You just gave us all this power. We're going to go out and do miracles. We're going to preach. I mean, you're even going to provide for us like through people. This is going to be like backpacking through Europe. I can't wait. And everyone's going to get saved probably. Right, Jesus? Nope. He says, I'm sending you out like sheep among what? What do wolves do when they get around sheep? Eat them. Now, you should be thinking, man, I thought Jesus was the good shepherd. What kind of good shepherd sends his sheep out to wolves? Because sheep are no match for wolves. Here's what he's doing. He's warning them. He's warning them and us that the mission that he's sending us on will be met with resistance. And he's preparing them for the resistance. He says, be shrewd or be as wise as what? Snakes. And he's saying, in essence, go, go do something that seems foolish, but be smart about it. Be wise with your words. Be wise with your actions and how you share the message. Basically, don't go to the barista at Starbucks or Dunkin', wherever you like to go, and on your way out, be like, hey, you know you're going to hell without Jesus, right? Like, that's not the mission. I did it, moving my feet, moving my lips. He's like, no, 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 be a little bit wiser than that. I love the example of Jesus with the woman at the well. He strikes up a conversation. He starts asking her about her life. And really through that conversation, he identifies an idol in her life, something that she's looking to for something that only God can provide. And what was her idol? Relationships. He says, go get your husband. Uh, I don't have one. Uh, you're right about that. You've had a few. And the dude you're living with now isn't your husband. She's like, whoa, okay. But you see, he can just like come in there. Like, like he got to know her and he used, he used wisdom. You guys remember when Peter is in the garden when they come for Jesus? You guys remember that part? And he takes out the sword. And what does he do? Chops a guy's ear off. The sword is a representation of the word of God. And there have been so many times in my life, especially when I first got saved and I was all zealous, where I used the word of God in such a way where I would cut someone's ear off and they couldn't hear what I was trying to say. I can remember I had a family member that was going through a really hard time and they were hurting and they don't know Jesus and they're saying, oh, I've been praying about this. And you know what verse I choose to quote to them? John 9, 31. Well, you know, the Bible says that God doesn't hear sinners. 
What, what do you think happened? Man, they fell right down on their knees and gave their life to Jesus. Nope. I was not wise as a serpent. We need to be wise with our words, but also innocent, gentle, gracious like doves. Some Christians love truth more than they love people. You ever meet one of those? You can tell by the way they talk or, or by how they post online. And Jesus says, no, there's got to be this combo thing. You got to be wise, but you got you to be gentle. I love 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. It says this, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be what? Gentle to all able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those that are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. You realize the mission is to make Jesus known. That's what we're going out to do. And, and Paul is telling Timothy, there's a way you do it. In the end, who's the one that grants people repentance? God, Jesus, they're both the right answer. Good job, yeah. We can't save people, but Paul says you have to present truth in a particular way. You've got to be gentle, patient, kind. Yes, correcting those that are in opposition, but do it in such a way that their hearts are softened to the truth. And this is what Jesus is calling us to do on this mission. As we will be met with resistance, we need a balance of both. And if we're honest, most of us are probably really good at one rather than the other. Some of us are really gentle and we don't want to offend and we don't want to ruffle any feathers. And some of us are just on the street corner on a soapbox saying, you're all going to hell without Jesus. Like, we got to get in the middle. We need a little bit of both. In verse 22, Jesus starts telling them, it's not just that you're going to be betrayed by like the courts and the government and the magistrates and all these people. He says, even those closest to you will betray you, family and friends. And here's, I mean, if Jesus is trying to like encourage them and inspire them, he says, oh, and also you're going to be hated by everyone. But why will they be hated by everyone for his sake? Don't go out. The goal is not, listen, brothers and sisters, the goal is not to go out and be hated by people. The goal is not to go out and be like the jerky Christian and condemning everyone Yep, I'm, I guess I'm following the mission because everybody hates me and you're a martyr. No, he says, when you follow me and live like me, the people are going to hate you. And, and this is the resistance that all of us will meet if we are living on mission. And you may be thinking, man, I'm not so sure I want to be part of this mission. This doesn't sound very fun. And many of us are not on mission because we fear this resistance, this questioning about our faith. If we tell someone about Jesus, what will I say? I won't have, I won't have the answers. I won't know what to do. We definitely don't want to be hated by everyone. But there is a blessing that comes with this resistance, and you may have missed it in verse 24 and 25. Jesus is, is saying, hey, if they did it to me first, if they persecuted me, if they resisted me, if they called me the devil and you guys are my followers, don't you think they're going to do it to you too? And here's the blessing. The more closely our lives follow the mission of Jesus, the more resistance we will be met with, but we, we will also be met with Jesus. When we suffer and walk in his shoes, there is a closeness with Jesus that comes from that. Everybody wants Easter Sunday. Nobody wants Good Friday. It's just the reality of it. Can't I just meet him at the empty tomb? No, no, there's, there's a cross too. And, and there, there is a blessing and an intimacy that comes with that. And you and I, if we're honest, we are prone to flee from suffering. And yet it's the very place that God wants to meet us. Has God ever met you in your suffering? Yeah? I'll tell you, my, my, my uh, youngest son, he had surgery a few weeks ago. And um, we were in the hospital, and I'm thinking, you know, God, God's going to use me. It's going to be awesome. Pastor Chris is in the hospital. I'm going to preach sermons to the nurses, and none of that. And I'm sitting in there, and I'm watching my son who has CP, and he can't speak. And there were times that were so difficult just watching him suffer. But, but here's, here's where God met me. 
as I was watching my son suffer and how hard it was and I couldn't do anything, I began to realize, Father, you let your son suffer for me like that. And if I could, I would help Jacob to stop suffering right now. And you had every bit of power and authority to make your son stop suffering, but you didn't. What kind of love is this? I experienced the love of God in my suffering that I would not have experienced any other way. And not to mention that the body of Christ came around my family in a way that I have never experienced before. You sometimes wonder, why does God allow suffering? You ever wonder that? You ever ask the question like, God, what's up with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Couldn't you just uprooted that thing and we'd all be good right now? You ever ask that question? Because then there would be no sin. But if there was no sin, there would be no need for what? A cross. And if there was no cross, we would never see this expression of the love of the Father that is so deep and wonderful and beautiful. Do not flee from suffering, brothers and sisters. That's where God wants to meet you. Don't let the possibility of resistance keep you sitting in your seat and not living on mission. I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his what? Sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Listen, at that time, now I don't know, and I can't point to like chapter and verse to back this up. I don't know that anyone knew Jesus in a deeper way than Paul at that time. And as he sits in prison, he's like, God's not done with me, and I'm not done with God. I want to know Jesus more. And you would think as that man sits there in suffering in prison, he'd be like, man, I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to be free. But as he sits there, he's like, you know, I also want to know him in his sufferings. Because he's met with me in those places in ways that I don't think I would meet with him anywhere else. You know, maybe you've heard the saying, there are some things about Jesus that can only be seen through tears. Like, like how many of you have learned something about God's goodness in suffering? And yes, like it's a major part of our testimonies. And so, yes, you will be met with resistance, but you will also be met with Jesus. Living, yes, like thank God for that. Living this life on mission will lead to a deeper relationship with Jesus. To know him more, to live like he lived, to do what he did, intimacy. And in those moments when you don't know what to say and someone asks you a question, he says, I'll be with you. I'll tell you what to say. So don't get all scared. Yes, there will be resistance, but God will be with you. When he sends them out at the end, what does he say? Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then what's the promise? And lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. The promise of his presence carries us through this resistance. Look with, with me at verse 26. So do not be afraid of them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside the Father's care? And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Stop right there. It's the third point, the third command for the mission. The mission requires courage. This mission will require courage. If you're hearing me right, if you're hearing Jesus right, you will start to understand that living life this way, you will be misunderstood, you will be lied about, you will be rejected, mocked, and hated. Living life on mission will bring those things, especially today, in our culture now more so than theirs, where truth is relative, where everyone gets to make up their own truth, where truth is a matter of personal opinion. What's true for you may not be true for me, and anyone who declares to have truth is an intolerant, arrogant monster. That's the, that's the world we live in. So when you show up on the scene saying, I have the truth, there's a way to get back to God, and it's only through Jesus. You're going to be met with resistance. 
And you might be thinking, I don't, I don't want to deal with all that. Like, can't I just come to church on Saturday and get my latte? <laughs> you may be afraid. The mission requires courage. And Jesus, in these few verses, tells us where to find it. Three times, verse 26, verse 28, verse 31. Don't be afraid. In verses 26 and 27, he says, don't be afraid because everything that is hidden will one day be seen. The truth that you speak, that others reject now, one day will be revealed. One of my favorite verses in Philippians is when Paul is encouraging us about that one day when every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Like a day is coming, guys, when he will so reveal himself in in a way that no one can deny, that every knee will bow before him. That day is coming. And this is what he's talking about. And this should encourage you. Not in a, hey, there'll be a day when you can look at all the people that rejected you and you say, told you so. It's not what he's saying. It's not what he means. What he is saying is that a day is coming when you will know that everything that you spoke, even the things that that brought pain and suffering and rejection, it's all still true. And the most loving and best thing that you can do is live your life on mission telling others about it. Does anyone go see a doctor ever? Uh, Anyone? Only five of you. Go see a doctor. Get your checkup. And listen, I'm with you. Like I think probably from 35 to 45, I did not go to a doctor at all. And now I'm old, as I said before. And here's, here's what I like about my doctor. My doctor is not afraid to tell me the truth. When I do my blood work, my, my doctor is not scared that she might offend me by the results. She tells me, and she tells me boldly because, because she knows that if I don't change my diet and get healthy, one day I will feel the consequences for myself, even though I can't see it now. And that is the kind of boldness that you and I have. Certainly we will tell the truth and some people say, I don't believe you. But listen, a day is coming when everything that you preach and say according to the mission will be made real. So do it. Fear not. Jesus is coming back. And until he does, until he does, you and I are on mission to tell others about him. He says, fear not. Therefore, go, open your mouth. Tell everyone about this, Jesus. Tell everyone about the gospel and the kingdom to come. And then in verse 28, it says, don't be afraid of men. And again, this is like not the most encouraging thing if you first read it. Don't be afraid of men who can kill you. (laughs) Thanks, Jesus. He's like, listen, the worst thing that can happen is they're going to kill you, okay? (laughs) But if you really know Jesus, you know that death has lost its sting. It still hurts. Like, I I know, I understand. It's still hard to lose someone, but death has lost its sting. Death, for us, ushers us into the presence of Jesus. Man, before I knew Christ, I can remember laying in my bed at night just wondering what would happen when I die. I was scared. Like, I have vivid memories of that. But when I came to know Jesus, I'm like, I'm ready. Like, how many of you guys are ready? I'm ready to go see Jesus. Like, I'm ready. And that's, that's why he's saying, he's like, listen, don't fear them. Rather fear, fear God. And not in like a cowering, fearful kind of way. Psalm 111 verse 10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you get to a place in your life when you care more about what God thinks than what man thinks, there will be no place for fear in your life. You will live your life on mission boldly. You won't care. And so he, what is he saying? Stop looking at them and look at me. This is always the remedy to fear, is it not? Remember David and Goliath? You guys remember that? And all the Israelites shaking in their boots. What were they looking at? This giant. And little boy David shows up. He's like, who the heck is this guy? Who is he to speak against our God? David was looking at God. And this is what Jesus is saying. Fix your gaze on God and fear will disappear. And then he says this, don't you know that you're more valuable than sparrows? That not even a sparrow dies apart from God's will. And you are more valuable than the birds of the air. And in the same way that nothing happens to them apart from the Father's will, nothing happens in your life. 
good or bad apart from the Father's will. Do you believe that? Yes. Man, we got to believe that. We got to believe that more than just here on a Saturday night where it's real easy to yes and amen things. Like this truth carries us as Christians. Nothing happens to us apart from the Father's will. He knows you. He knows when you suffer. He knows every hair on your head or the lack thereof for some of us. You know what I'm saying? But wh wh why is this a reason not to fear? Because he knows you, he loves you, and he is for you. And when you suffer, he sees. And at just the right time, he comes through. How many, how many of you guys like, have had God come through for you just at the right time? Yeah. And I'm always like, I, I would have rather had you come like 10 days earlier, God. But he has never let me down. He is faithful and he loves us. It's not just that we have the God of the universe sitting on a throne who's for us. We have a father in heaven who loves us and is for us. And so he says, don't be afraid. Your father will take care of you. This mission requires courage. I get it. And you know who's going to give it to you? Him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's close here in verse 32. Whoever acknowledge, acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Last point, fourth point. The mission will cost you, but the reward is great. The mission will cost you, but the reward is great. Jesus, Jesus, isn't one of the names for Jesus Prince of Peace? So what did he just say there in verse 34? Do not suppose that I came to bring peace. Initially, Jesus comes to bring peace between us and who? God. You see, because of our sin, we've got a problem with God. The Bible says there's enmity. We are enemies of God because we live lives of rebellion against him. Jesus comes to bring peace, but he says, don't get it twisted. I didn't come to bring peace necessarily between men. I actually came to bring a sword. That if you follow me and you live on mission and you do it publicly, you saw what he said there about acknowledging him publicly? When you, listen, your faith is, your faith is not a private matter. When I was growing up and I was little, I remember the saying, I haven't really heard it anymore, but the two things you don't talk about is what? Religion and politics. Your faith is not a private matter. It is not meant to be hidden. It is not meant to be relegated to Saturday nights. And Jesus says, when you live it out, there will be division that will come. When you tell others that you are on mission for me, it will cause problems in your relationships. This mission will cost you. How many of you guys, when you first came to know Jesus, you lost friends? I did. I can remember I got saved here like 20-something years ago, and all my friends were like, oh, you just joined a cult, bro. And they're brainwashing you, and I remember them always saying, don't worry, you'll be back. And I lost so many friends. Some of you, you, you were in a relationship with someone, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, and one of you came to know Jesus and the other one didn't. And, and you knew, like, I don't think we can continue because I love Jesus more than I love anything else. 
you realize that in some countries, for someone to acknowledge that they're in a relationship with Jesus and living for him, they will be disowned by their families and some even put to death. How blessed are we in this country? Okay? Like, let me just say that. This mission will cost you relationships. If you hide it, it may not. If you're not living on mission and nobody really knows about your relationship with Jesus, it may not. It will cost you, though. It truly will cost you relationships. It will also cost you your life. You must be willing to lose your life for the sake of this mission. Jesus says to take up your what? Now, you got to know, this is before the first Easter You see, when we think of the cross, we always think of it in relation, not just to Good Friday, but to Easter Sunday, because we know the end of the story, right? The empty tomb. For Jesus to say, pick up your cross, they must have been like, what? A cross? I definitely don't want to be part of this mission. An instrument of torture in death. Yeah, I want you to pick it up and not just pick it up. What do you do once you pick it up? Carry it. Follow him. It's not just coming to a place and picking up the cross and dropping it and going back to your life. He says, pick up your cross and follow me for all to see. You're like, man, this is a depressing message. (laughs) Guys, this is the mission. This is the mission that we have been called to. But, But there is a reward. Yes, it will be hard. Yes, there will be loss. But what you gain from following Jesus is far greater than anything you will ever lose. Do you know that? And, and, here, and here's the thing that I think, I, I believe that it's possible for some people who are actually followers of Jesus to miss. Some of us aren't willing to pay the price. Some of us aren't willing to pick up our cross. And in not being willing to pick up our cross and pay the cost, we never find the true purpose for our life. Because we have our own plans. And we have our own ideas of what we're supposed to do with our life. You know, I only got one story, so I tell it a lot. But before I came to know Jesus, I was getting my master's degree in business. I'm working out like in the corporate world. And my life is all about making money. That's what I want to do. I went to college for all these years. I've got this investment from my parents. Like, this is going to be my, my gig. And then my mom keeps telling me, you know, I'm praying that you'll be a pastor, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. Keep praying, mom. <laughs> and then God's like, hey, um, I think I want you to be in ministry. And there was this wrestle. But this was my plan. Like, I can still live for you over here. I can still do this. Yeah, you could, but I've got a different purpose and a plan for your life, and you will miss it. You'll still get to heaven, of course, because that's by grace, but you will miss the purpose for your life. So many people in this world, they chase all these things because they want to find their purpose and do what they were made to do. You will never find your purpose if you cling to your life. This mission will cost you, but the reward, I mean, when you get to heaven and you see your father and he says, well done, well done. You were faithful with the mission. You were willing to lay down your life, just like my son did for you. Let me, let me just be so clear about this. And I wanted to say this in the beginning. I forgot. This is not a message that says, be a good soldier so that God will love you more. That is not this message. This message is God loves you unconditionally. Now go be a good soldier. That's the gospel. And listen, he he won't twist your arm. He won't force you. He's so good like that. If I were God, I'd force you. (laughs) Some of us are missing out on the mission. We don't want to pay the cost. We don't want to go. We like coming. Like coming here and worshiping you're in a Bible study, like we like that, but we're not willing to go and move our feet and move our lips. We're not willing to put ourselves out there and be met with some kind of resistance. We, we don't want that. 
It'll require courage. It'll require you to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Here's the thing I love about Jesus. Everything that he's calling them and us to do, he did it first. What kind of God is that? Again, if I'm God, I'm just ordering you around. Go do it. But he did it first. How good is our God? So good. Listen, in the same way today, Jesus is calling his disciples to attention. The mission remains the same. Guys, it's serious. It's not just another study through the book of Matthew. Like, this is serious. It's not optional. I mean, I'm, and again, I'm not saying you lose your salvation. I'm saying you'll miss out. And so here's how I want to kind of close this part. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. I'd ask all of you to close your eyes, those of you that are still awake. Close your eyes. (laughs) And this is not a, a moment of shame. I want you to just think and consider and take inventory of your life right now. Have you been living on mission like this? Have you been actively going out into the world and into your life, moving your feet, moving your lips, telling people about the one who saved you and changed you? You'll be able to tell if you have been because you will. He promises it. If you're doing that, you will be met with resistance. So if you can't remember the last time you met met with resistance, you may not be on the mission. And so maybe some of you are on it. Great. I love it. Praise God. Keep doing it. But maybe for some of us, we're like, you know what? I've been more of a a come and see kind of Christian than I am a go and tell. And here's what I love about God. He will give grace to the humble. If you're simply willing to say, God, I need your help. And so if you say, you know what? I, I haven't been doing that, but I want to. We can do nothing apart from him. And so if that's you, I just want to ask you to stand in your seat where you're at as a, as a response to this. I'm going to pray over those of you who say, I want to live on this mission. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to waste my life. God has called me to be a light in this world, and I'm really not doing it. And listen, don't. You, I know you hear seats and stuff like that. This is only if you hear the voice of your father, please. And as you stand, if you could just open up your hands in a position of receiving. Father, we want to thank you first for sending your son for us. We thank you for the mission of our king who who moved out of heaven, who came to this earth and who willingly gave himself over to suffer, to be betrayed, to be persecuted, also that we might come to know you. And now we want to do the same. We want to follow in the footsteps of our Savior. And I know that what you see here in this room tonight, I know it pleases you, Father. And so please, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, fall and stir in everyone's heart right now a burden, a desire, a passion, a courage to live this life on mission to make Jesus known. God, I pray right now that you would even lay the one person on our hearts that you want us to talk to this week, the person you want us to invite to Easter, whatever that might look like. God, give us the courage to do what seems foolish. Help us to be wise as serpents, gentle as doves. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. And help us to be willing to lay down not just our plans, our lives for the sake of the gospel. We want to make you known. We we can't wait for you to come back, Jesus. But we want to be busy about your business until you do. 
Send us, use us for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. You guys wanna have a seat real quick? Amen. Hey, let me just say this for those of you that stood. Don't leave here and let the enemy steal that. Don't leave here and be like, oh, I stood up, I said this prayer. If, if you did, God wants to use you this week. And pray every morning, God, give me an opportunity. I promise you he'll answer that prayer. But before we close, before we close, I want to give those of you that are in this room that, that don't necessarily know Jesus in a personal way to enter into that relationship. The gospel is not good advice. I read that this week. It's just stuck with me. It's not good advice. It's good what? It's good news. And good news is only good news when you understand that there is bad news. I'm not here to pull punches, to try to convince you of something. I just want to present to you the truth in love that all of us are born into this world separated from the God who made us and loves us. And it's what the Bible calls sin. It's us rebelling against God. It's what Adam and Eve did in the garden when they said, God, we know you said to do this, but we're going to do it our way. We all do that. And the Bible says that that is the very thing that separates us from God, so we can't be in a relationship with him. And that's the bad news. We have no way to fix it. We can't make it right. We can't turn our lives around and be better people and start doing enough good deeds and reading our Bible and coming to church. Those things won't save you. The only thing that will save you, the only one that will save you is Jesus. And that's why he came. That's why he left heaven. He moved his feet, if you will. And he lived this life so perfectly, exactly as the Bible calls us to live it. He lived a perfect life on our behalf because the only way to get to heaven, it's not just that you have to be sinless, you have to be perfect. You have to do all this perfectly. God said, I know you can't do that. I'm gonna send my son to do it for you. And then he's gonna die on a cross to pay for every mistake you have ever made and every mistake you will ever make. And he says, I'm willing to give you this gift of forgiveness, of peace, of hope, most importantly, of relationship with God. We have the hope of heaven, but the best thing about salvation is that we are brought back to God, the one who made us. But you see, there's got to be a moment in your life where you are willing to acknowledge that you need him. You heard me say, yeah, I got saved in this church like 20 years ago, and I can remember sitting in this church week after week and saying, I don't need that. That's for all these crazy Christians with their hands up crying. And I remember the day God opened my eyes and I realized, oh, I do need God. I'm not perfect and I'm not going to live forever. And one day I'm going to stand before God and I will be guilty. And when I, when that, like, that weight of my sin hit me, it's like, it's like I saw Jesus for the first time. And listen, I was raised in church. I knew all about Jesus up here, but I never knew him here. But when I saw him and I realized, oh, I need him. I surrendered my life to him that day and I've never been the same. And it's not because I'm a good person. It's because he's a good God. And, and if you're here tonight and, and you're thinking, oh, I come to church. Listen, coming to church will not change your life. It's good, but it won't change your life. Jesus changes your life. A relationship with Jesus changes everything. And he will not force himself on you. He will not force you to follow him. He brings you to places like this. He's probably put some crazy Christians in your life that keep loving you and praying on for you. And maybe he will even use difficult situations to get you to a place where you're ready to come to him. But then he says, all right, now it's your turn to choose. So they're going to play a song right now. And when they play this song, it's going to be your time to acknowledge Jesus publicly. You're like, I did not come here tonight for this. Let me just tell you this. He brought you here tonight for this. And so when the song starts, if you're willing to get up out of your seat and come stand right here, when the song ends, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'll give you the words to say, but it will be your heart. No one can say this prayer for you. Not a praying mom or grandma or spouse or brother or sister. This is about you and God. It doesn't matter if you were raised in the church. There's got to come a moment in your life where you say, I need Jesus. And when you do, he accepts you with open arms and he changes your life. Church, 
in moments like this, I know that we keep our eyes open and we clap if anyone comes forward. I, but I'm asking you to be in some serious prayer tonight, okay? Like this is a spiritual battle probably happening in someone's heart. And they're like, man, won't this guy just be quiet? I want to get out of here. That's because God is calling you. And there's an enemy who wants to do everything he can to keep you from Jesus. Church, please be in prayer that God would open eyes and draw people to himself. If that's you and you want to get right with God tonight and you want forgiveness and peace and hope and salvation, it is yours for the taking. If that's you, when the song starts, get out of your seat, come forward. We'll pray that prayer together. Church, pray. Guys, play. And if that's you, come. Are you hurting and broken? Hey, maybe you're watching online right now and you realize you've been pursuing your own mission instead of God's. We just want to encourage you to open your heart to whatever God is doing today. And if you've never opened your heart to Christ, you'll have a chance to pray a simple prayer in a moment that will change your life and your eternity. As Jonice and I are here at a local nursing home in our community, it's a great reminder that it's never too late or too early to give your heart to Jesus. Our volunteers in the chat are available to talk to you and answer any questions you may have. So please feel free to use this chat tool and reach out to us today. And as we join our pastor again, if God is calling you today, go ahead and pray that prayer with him. And afterwards, we'll give you some next steps. We love you and we're praying for you. Blood of Jesus Christ, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, before we pray with everyone that's up here, I, I just want to make sure that if you're sitting in your seat, you're struggling, you're battling, and you think you should be up here right now, we won't sing another song, but I will wait another moment. I, I sat there and I, I came up with all the excuses of the world why I shouldn't give my life to Jesus. And it's my greatest regret as a Christian that I didn't make this decision sooner, what they're about to do. And so if you're still in your seat, you need to come up here. I'll wait a moment longer. This is your time. God loves you just as you are. He will change you. But he's not asking you to clean up your act first. He just wants you to come to him. And so maybe everyone that's supposed to be up here is up here. But if you're supposed to be, I'll wait just a moment longer. If that's you, you can come now. We'll wait for you to come down and we'll pray that prayer together. But if not, it's okay. We'll pray for these people that are here right now. All right. So guys, here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to pray for you. And after we pray for you, I'm going to give you some words to pray out loud. And I don't want you just to repeat after me. I want you to think about the words that you're saying. I want you to think about who you're saying it to. You're saying it to the God who loves you so much that he gave his son for you. And so if you would, close your eyes. Church, if you would, extend a hand. Let's pray for everyone that's here. Father, thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for the gospel, the good news that though we were hopeless and helpless apart from you, you made a way where there wasn't one. You sent your son, Jesus. And I thank you for everyone that is at the foot of this altar right now. I thank you for drawing them to yourself. I thank you for the faith that you've given them and the decision that they have made to surrender their life into your hands. God, make good on your promise to make them a new creation. I pray that even now they would just feel the burden of, of their sin and of guilt or shame or anything they're carrying. I pray that you would lift that and they would just feel this peace knowing that their sins have been forgiven and they belong to you all because of what Jesus has done. Bless them, Father. Bless them abundantly in Jesus' name. And for those of you that are here, I want you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Say, say with me, Lord God, I admit that I've sinned and I need Jesus. I believe that he's my God. And I believe that he's my savior. So tonight I open my heart. I invite him inside. And I surrender. 